Thank you, Tuli. It is nice to be up here. It's been almost two months since I came back from Kenya. Uh, and also, before I forget, this is a parenthesis, uh, we want to thank everyone that participated at the church picnic. It was awesome. It was hot. Uh, but we also want to just once again thank every volunteer, the staff, and everyone that came out. Uh, it was extremely fun. To the point, there are people in our audience and our staff that wants to do it twice a year. We're still um, <laughs> debating on that one. Yeah, some are quitting, some are going away, if that happens, but uh, it was extremely fun just to be with one another and just fellowship. So this week, uh, we were watching a movie uh, entitled 14 Peaks, Nothing is Impossible. It's about a Nepalese mountaineer named, uh, named Purja, who embarks in this incredible mission to climb all 14 of the world's 8,000 meter peaks in the world in a record seven months. Now, above 18,000 meters, it is known as the zone of death, okay? And this guy is trying to do it in seven months. To put in context, the previous person climbed it in 17 years, and he's trying to do this in seven months. But as we get into the movie, you begin to see some of the challenges and some of the difficulties and how expensive it is to acquire and to accomplish this. And halfway through the movie, there's a quote that comes up there by the individual that climbed the mountain 17 years ago, and he states the following. He says, most of us forget that from the beginning of our lives, we're approaching death. Most of us forget that from the beginning of our lives, we're approaching death. If we think about it, this is so true. Scary true, terrifying true, I will say. Now, this quote did not just hit me in that moment, but it hit me six years ago when I turned 40. I just gave you how old I am. When I was 40 years old, it hit me that I was at my halfway point of life, assuming that I would live up to 80, right? Assuming. Now, from that moment, I understood that as opposed to gaining days or gaining years, I actually was losing days and years. Now, that began to change my mindset in terms of the things that I will do with my life and how I'll go with my life. So I set certain goals, and one of those goals was to go on mission trips on an annual basis and travel as a family probably two to three times a year to visit different countries. I calculate, God willing, that I will have 20 more years of good life and health to do this travel, right? Assuming that nothing goes wrong between now and when I'm 66, okay? Assuming that I can do this, I'm embarking in the longest and toughest countries now instead of waiting when I'm 70 and 80 years because it gets a little bit more difficult. Now, with that said, some of us have begun to think about our mortality. Some of us have begun to think about that life is not granted or eternal, but we're just mere mortals. Now, what happens to our mindset? What happens when we realize that we don't have this many years to live, or many decades, or we are at the end of our journey? For some of us, it might be a great time to reflect and to retroanalyze some of our accomplishments or our failures, some of our regrets, or some of our successes, some of our defeats and triumphs. But maybe it's a great opportunity to make changes in our life and change our scope and direction. Now, for King Solomon, Solomon, as we read in 1 Kings 11, he's at the end of his life. He doesn't have the opportunity to go back and fix some of the mistakes that he did. And what's more interesting is that it's not Solomon doing the analysis, it's actually God. God is the one that is analyzing his life, looking at his success and failures, his accomplishments and his triumphs and his defeats and his regrets. As we move through the verses, we'll see the life of King Solomon at the end of his life. So if you open the Bible, which we just read it with Tuli, in 1 Kings 11, 1, there's this phrase that says, Now King Solomon loved, what? Many, what? Foreign wives. Now this is significant, because when we get to the book of Kings at chapter 11, that is actually the middle of the book, when things are going to begin to shift and change. So this phrase right here is the cause that leads Israel to be divided and to be separated and eventually go into slavery. Now, when we read 1 Kings, if you have a chance to read it, you will see the before and after effect before you get to uh, 1 Kings 11. 
Now, the united monarchy under Solomon that we see in chapters 1 through 11, followed by the death of David into the transition of Solomon, now gave way to the divided nation of Israel and Judah in chapters 12 through 22. At Solomon's death, his captain Jeroboam revolted with the ten northern tribes called Israel, while his son Rehoboam became king over the southern tribes of Judah and Benjamin, which were later on called Judah. So in summary, this is what happened in the, kings, or the book of Kings. For the first chapters, 1 through 11, we see unity. We see a kingdom flourishing, passing the torch from David to Solomon. But because of Solomon's decisions to love many foreign women, we begin to see the deterioration and the decay of Israel and eventually their demise. So when we get to chapter 11, it's not the beginning of Solomon's life. It's in essence the end of his life. But what was it at the beginning? So when we go to a funeral, we hear about how wonderful this person was, right? All the things and everyone loved him. Have you ever gone to a funeral that no one loved the individual, right? Everyone is great. Everyone was a loving husband. Everyone was a loving father. They did so many things. There's like no bad people in the world. Now, for King Solomon, we have to go back to the beginning. So open your Bibles, and we will read a couple of verses just to get a background story. Who is Solomon? We all know who he is. But I want you to begin to think about how did Solomon became Solomon in 1 Kings 11? Because it was not that at the beginning. King Solomon actually was an individual that wanted to seek God. And we see that in 1 Kings 3, 6 through 7. So I will read a couple of verses before that, and it says... And Solomon said, you have shown great and steadfast loves to your servant David, my father, because he walked before you in faithfulness and righteousness and not rightness and heart towards you. And you have kept him for this great and steadfast loves and have given him a son to sit on his throne this day. Verse number seven. And now, O Lord, my God, you have made your servant king in place of David, my father, Although I am but a little child, I do not know how to go out or come in. And what I underline here is the latter part. He recognizes that he's a child. He recognizes his humanity. He recognizes his weakness. And he understands how large of a task will be for him to follow in his father's footsteps. So far, so good. An individual that is seeking the Lord and asking for help. Him to guide him. As we go through the verses in 8 and 9, it says, And your servant is in the midst of your people who have chosen a great people, too many to be numbered or counted for multitude. Give your servant, therefore, an understanding mind to govern your people that I might discern between good and evil. For who is able to govern this, your great people? Imagine the opportunity that you have to be in front of God and be asked to be granted anything that you want. I'm sure the last thing will be wisdom. And this is what Solomon recognizes. I cannot do this under my own merits. I need a divine intervention. I need divine help. So he asked for discernment. He asked for wisdom to guide Israel. And as we move into the last part, Imagine the Lord saying these words to Solomon. Read it with me out loud. Kings 3.10, it says, It pleased the Lord that Solomon had asked this. Let's repeat it again. It pleased the Lord that Solomon had asked this. How awesome it is for our Father, our Heavenly Father, to find happiness in our decisions. God was so happy with his choice. He was so happy that Solomon knew his weakness in humanity and he needed divine guidance. As we read further in 1 Kings 3, if you want to read a little bit more, not only God grants his wishes, which is to be wise and to discern, but also God gives him an amount of insanity, amount of wealth, and honor. Then he also gets a bonus on verse number 14. It says, if you keep my ways, if you keep my status, statutes and my commandments, as your father David walked, 
then I will lengthen your days here on earth. Not only did God give him wisdom, he gave them the wealth and the honor that he did not sought after, but he also will give him longevity if he will be in his presence. When you get to 1 Kings 4, 30 and 34, you get a glimpse of his wisdom. It says, he spoke 3,000 proverbs, and his songs were 1,005. He spoke of trees from the cedar that is in Lebanon to the high sub that is gross on the wall. He spoke also the beasts and the birds and the reptiles and the fish. And people of all nations came to hear the wisdom of Solomon and from all the kings of the earth who had heard of his wisdom. God granted his wish. Now, if we were to graph this, this is what it would look like. 1 Kings 3, 6 through 10. He's on a trajectory to be successful. He is to be one of the greatest kings on earth. He's able to continue the legacy of David. He will be able to continue his own legacy, and his children will continue that legacy. If we'll put it in a sports uh, example, this is the number one draft pick. Right? He is a 5 tool player in Major League Baseball. He has an amazing physical ability. He is a generational type player, a can't miss prospect. But we know what happens. So what happens between 1 Kings 3 and 1 Kings 11? He is asking the right things. He is asking for the right things. But along the way, something happens. Now, we're going to move on to the second half of the sermon, and this is what I entitled the E! True Hollywood Story of King Solomon. <laughs> oh, you know what I'm talking about, okay? This is where you talk about the tragic, the misfortunes, the addictions. This is where you bring in, you know, behind the scenes, never looked at footage before to talk about an individual. So what happened to our beloved King Solomon? How did everything go wrong? Well, it's broken down for us. Step by step by step by step. Now, as we read this, do not do like we usually do. Oh, that is King Solomon. That is his mistakes. That would never happen to me. As we read through the verses, substitute the wives and the loves for something that you are seeking and something that you're loving. And ask the question, is that getting me closer to God or is that getting me further from God? And as we read the verses in 1 Kings 11, we begin to notice that Solomon along the way, he forgot God. The knowledge that he had, the wisdom he, he was granted, corrupted him. Began to look after his own flesh and his own lust. So what were the circumstances that led him to go away from the Lord? Where did it all go wrong? And we begin to see in verse number one. There's the answer. Underline it. Highlight it. Go back to it. Reread it multiple times. Because he loves so many foreign women. That's it. That's the answer. Now, in order to put it into context, you have to go to Deuteronomy. In Deuteronomy, God forbids the people of Israel to get in love or marriage or in bed with foreign women. Solomon ignored that. Look what verse number two did. Not only did he love the women from other nations that God had forbidden in Deuteronomy, but he clung to these in love. In other words, he began to seek after. He began to lust over. He began to desire them more than seeking the Lord. Verse number three. This shows an uncontrolled, unhinged, unsatiable lust for sin. Now, most of us do not end that way. 
whether it's alcoholism or porn or drugs or, you know, whatever it is, the sin that we're lusting over. It starts as a gradual, right? We make compromises. Then all of a sudden, two years later, three years later, four years later, a decade later, we look back and we notice that the decisions that we made that we thought it was just one small step have now moved us away and further away from God. Now, what began to just to be love and to be lustful towards foreign women, in verse number four, we begin to see that Solomon not only turned his heart towards the women, but he also turned his heart towards their God. So I want you to begin to think about this as a progression. He thought maybe getting the first wife was not an issue, or the tenth, or the hundredth, or the tenth concubine. But as this began to be more and more and more, not only did he love them and pursue them, but also began to pursue their gods. Now, we have to pause and begin to think about what are the concessions that we're making in our life that potentially can snowball and become an avalanche of sin? What are the things that we're making right now? What are the decisions that we're making right now that eventually could turn us away from the Lord? And as we read more, we begin to see just the accumulation, the progression of his sin. When we get to number 5, verse number 5, it says, First Samuel went after Ezra, the goddess of the Sidonians, and after Malchon, an abomination of the Ammonites. Now we begin to see a pursuit of not just the wise, but of the gods. Verse number 6, Solomon did what was evil in the eyes of God and completely disobeyed the Lord. Now, the question is, if we were had Solomon sitting on the E. True Hollywood story and we were to interview him, can we ask him, did you know what we were doing was wrong? Right? You were the wisest man in the world. Did you have any clue that what you were doing was getting you further and further away from the Lord? And most likely he will say no. Because when we are sin and we were driven by sin, we're not thinking of anything else. So when we get to these verses, we begin to see how quickly it snowballed into what it became. Verse number 7, Solomon began to build temples in the high places where God forbidden before to build temples and to seek gods. When we get to verse number 8, Solomon made offerings and sacrifices to the God. It was no longer the wives participating in this. Now it's Solomon taking offerings and sacrifices to the gods. Now, for me, it's interesting here because this implies an investment, implies planning, and implies energy, and implies a willingness to do all of this. So the question is, what are the resources that we have at this moment that are being, for use of a better word, mismanaged not being used to its full potential because we're seeking other things that are not divine or godly. Now, all of us have to make these decisions on a day-to-day. Do I go to Starbucks or I donate to missions? Right? Do I pay for Apple TV plus Paramount Plus, part Netflix plus Amazon Prime, plus Disney Plus, what else? Plus Hulu, Right? Or do I separate that money and then, you know, I put it into a savings account? I don't know, right? We're all making these decisions day to day. Do I buy the expensive fender, right? Or do I buy the hybrid car, right? We're all making decisions day to day. Now, for King Solomon, he began to divest his money in constructions of temples for his wives. And remember how many wives he had? Hundreds. How many concubines? Hundreds. So think about the investment. Think about the planning. So now we begin to see another progression. 
So once again, substitute wives and concubines for something that you potentially are struggling with. Now for Solomon, it began as a simple, oh, I'm just going to marry one or two or three. By the end, it was 900. At the end, it was 300. Now, it began as a slow progression. It was not overnight. This was decades in the making. And for many of us, we could be in that slippery slope. Those decisions that we're making. The compromises that Brandon spoke about last week. right? Those little things that we're just doing that we think have no consequences in our life. Now, when we turn the page and we begin to see the end of Solomon's life, God is judging his life. And remember what he said on 1 Kings 3, 10, right? I am pleased with King Solomon and his decision. But let's read together the final verses that we're going to look at today. And it says, and the Lord was what? Angry. Now, that word, I could just marinate it and just sit on it over and over again. Right? We know that we as children are always seeking approval from our parents, our loved ones, individuals that we care for. And when we disappoint them, how does that make us feel? But imagine those words coming directly from our Savior and our Creator. And the Lord was angry with Solomon. But why? He gives you the answer. Because his what? His heart had turned away from the Lord. Now, if you read the, the verses that are associated with the heart, right? there's an emphasis to the heart. Don't trust your heart. Right? The God of Israel, who had appeared to him twice, right? I showed up twice to you. I spoke to you twice. I gave you the things that you wanted. Verse number 10. And had commanded him concerning these things that he should not go after the gods. In other words, he was foretold, he was warned, plus it was written. But he did not keep them from what the Lord commanded. Therefore, the Lord said to Solomon, and this is the punishment, this is the outcome of his disobedience. The Lord says, since this has been your practice and you have not kept my commandments and my statutes that I have commanded you, I will surely tear the kingdom from you and will give it to your servants. Yet for the sake of David, your father, I will not do it in your days, but I will tear it out of the hand of your son. We begin to see the destruction and the device and the division of what will become Israel. You can read that in Jeremiah, Nehemiah, the prophets, Daniel. So we get to the end of King Solomon's life. The Lord is not happy with his decisions. He's not telling him how great you were how you maintain your father's commandments. Now, for all of us, sooner or later, we'll get to the end. Now, but how does this point us to Jesus, right? The good, the better, and the ugly. That's the series that we're looking at. And there's two ways that King Solomon does that for us. Number one, the good of Solomon reminds us, or reminds me, of the greatness that love faithfulness and righteousness of our Lord Jesus Christ. We see that in 1 Kings 3, 6 to 10. And the bad of the ugly of Solomon reminds me how weak I am in my own flesh. How weak I am when I'm being led by sin and not by God. How I need to be redeemed and saved. And we sang today, nothing but the blood of Jesus can wash away my sins. Our sins are many, but his mercy is what? More. Now, King Solomon did not have this opportunity, the regrets to change his life, 
to give up all the wives and the concubines. But you and I are sitting here. We're not at the end of our lives. We have an opportunity to reflect. We have an opportunity to do an analysis of our lives and say, what are the things that I can do different? What are the things that I can change? How can I change the legacy of my family? How can I maintain the commandments and the statutes that God had given me? But for us Christians, if we go Philippians 1, Paul writes it and writes it the best. And he says, for me to live is Christ. And to die is what? Not a loss, but a what? We're not walking around thinking that tomorrow is my last day, so therefore I should celebrate because I'm going to be with Christ. Correct? Right? It's like a deep sorrow, deep sadness. And I remember when my grandma died. I remember going. We went there with my child. Uh, luckily, my son was able to see her when he was six months. And then we were traveling there again when he was nine months to El Salvador. And I remember we arrived on a Friday morning or Friday night. My grandma goes into the hospital on Thursday night. And she doesn't come out. She dies. So now I have to call my dad. My mom comes down, my sister comes down, and they're all weeping and crying. I'm like, why? This was one of the most faithful, prayful ladies that I know. She is in God and singing and praising and probably praying for us, right? I did not cry. I did not feel sadness for her loss. Now, we all experience different feelings. But if we look at Philippians 1, it says, For me to live is Christ." and to die is gain. If I, I am to live in the flesh, that means fruitful labor for me. In other words, a lot of work, right? Yet, which I should choose, I cannot tell. I am hard-pressed between the two. My desire is to depart and to be with Christ, for that is far better. That should be our slogan, right? That should be our bumper sticker, right? If you hit me, if I die, right? Thank you, right? I'm going to heaven, right? <laughs> Maybe we should order a couple stickers for next week. No, Bobby? Do we have budget for that, right? But imagine the sense of Paul, right? And remember, Paul is living near-death experiences day to day. And he's saying, this is my desire to be with the Lord. But in the meantime that I'm in this earth, I got to work. I got to share, share his love, share about him. Now, this is also a reminder that we need a Savior at its highest point in our life, but also at our lowest point. It is also a reminder that we need a Savior at every stage of our life. When we're young, when we want to be the next Instagram sensation or the YouTube sensation, right? Or going to college and being a freshman or graduating with our first degree or second degree, when I get our first job, I need a Savior. When I'm engaged, I need a Savior. When I'm married, you definitely need a Savior. <laughs> and when you have children, Lord, we all need a Savior. Right? Now, King Solomon reminds us that God wants something in our lives. I'm a big believer that God has a purpose for each of us. It questions about obedience or disobedience. It's a question about listening or not listening. It's about doing or not doing. And before I forget, talking about doing and not doing, September 16th through the 18th, we're planning to go to Kenya if we have a team that wants to go with us. So you got a couple months or weeks to pray on it, right? Seek me out. But also, Right? It's an opportunity to live by faith and to walk by faith and to see what God is doing. Bow your heads. And this moment that we have before we take communion and before we get the Bobby up here, this is an opportunity for a small retroanalysis of our life. An opportunity to see what our steps are like. What are we doing right? What are we doing wrong? What we need to change? What are the things that we have tried but we have not been successful at? I was talking to someone this week, and he says, 
I'm struggling with pornography. It cycles in my life. I know I have to kick it. I have to move away from that. What are the things that we are wrestling with at this particular moment? What are the things that we're compromising that seem small right now, but could have an avalanche or a sinful effect? I'll give you a couple minutes to reflect. And as you reflect and as you pray, please join me in communion, remembering that His grace is abundant that his mercy is overflowing, that his blood washes away our sin. Dear Father, we thank you for this moment. We praise you, Father, for who you are and what you are and what you're doing. Father, we pray that every individual here has a divine understanding and engagement and wisdom of their divine purpose here on earth. Father, we pray that we are able to seek you wholeheartedly, that we are able to repent, we're able to confess, but we're also able to hold on to the cross. Join me in partaking of the communion.